anything happened to my voice, I would... Drink a lot? Call a helpline? <laughs> yeah, I probably would. Scott, um, maybe we can talk about something else, like your daughter and maybe where she's going. You never going. think about what happens when you die? No, I don't really like to think about that. Yeah, I do. All the time. Bye. David getting here. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. It's David. It's David. David. He just smells it like a moron. Hello. Hi, David. Jeff in Vegas. How are you? Oh, hey, pleasure to meet you. I'm glad you and Gavin got a chance to chat before I could log in here. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's Gavin. You guys yeah. it. <laughs> well, thank you both for talking to me today for last call. And, uh, you know, Gavin, first of all, what a technical feat. I mean, two continuous shots of both characters. Take us through your coverage of Last Call and the discussion of pulling this off. Because I know you both, uh, not only you're the star, uh, that, David, but you were also, you know, um, the screenwriter. So you guys must have just worked so closely together on this. So tell me, take me through this. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the technical side of it, the, the idea of doing a movie in real time, I, I feel there's only certain justifications for doing that other than just the, the cool factor. We all love single take music videos, OK Go videos. Are, they're, those guys are heroes to me. I love their stuff. But in this story, you know, our, our story is very simple. Man tries to call a suicide hotline, misdials by one digit, connects with a random stranger. Uh, and, and in that, we thought if we could put the audience sort of in, in Beth's shoes, in, in her shoes, as she learns who this man is, why he's on the phone and decides to stay on the phone and try to change the outcome of the night and his life, that the real time aspect would add that you could hang on every word she says, you know, every, every, every precious moment, everything she says could change the outcome. That if we never gave you a break from that kind of tension, that that would be the perfect way to tell the story. And then we thought, well, you know, if we can show both sides of it at the same time, that becomes a more interesting visual feat. Because again, it is a very simple movie um, there's, there's no car chases. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no backwards uh, action sequences like tenants. Uh, there's nothing like that. So we just have, we have two people having a conversation <laughs> sort of visually keep that interesting. Um, you're able to look at both sides of this phone call at the same time for the duration of the movie. But that meant having two camera crews in two different parts of a city filming simultaneously and David and his co-star Sarah Booth had to actually act over the telephone. They were they were never in the same space together. Uh, so it just uh, we just sort of um, and we did this all on a on a micro budget. So it was a very very fun challenge to see if we could even. I, I had less gray hairs before this movie started. Let's let's put it that way. And David, as star and screenwriter of Last Call, uh, does it have a personal meaning for you? I mean, what what was the source of the story? Uh, you know, the source of the story was actually, um, I was inspired by a very close friend of mine who was uh, finishing her training to be a volunteer at the crisis prevention hotline. And she was kind of telling me some of the, you know, some of the different people that she had spoken to in her training. And she was just at the point then where she was answering calls herself and, you know, had a support system there if she needed. Um, but these, it just sounded like, to me, like the most the most basic uh, human connection, this need to have a stranger that's willing to listen and that's going to immediately care enough about you to try and give you a reason to see tomorrow. And uh, it, it just struck me that, to, that it could be so simple, um, that, that we all have the power and, you know, essentially to, um, to do that same thing by just being willing to listen. And, um, and so, you know, come in, putting the concept together, like how do you make a, a telephone conversation interesting for 80 minutes? Um, that's where we came up with the idea of um, doing it all in, in a single take and, and showing both sides simultaneously. Uh, and, it, you know, there's... It de it de oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean... Builds and I didn't expect it to get so emotional and so intense. I really didn't. 
And so you, you had you had me heavy breathing towards the end. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I I apologize and thank you all at the same time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, Gavin, having you know being <laughs> from high school theater and college theater, and this this movie seems so much that staged like a play. Did you employ the philosophy "Don't stop for anything" during shooting? Absolutely. The only reason people, if if I wasn't calling cut, it would only be if say a cameraman fell down some stairs or something that was an obvious reset that we needed to do. Fortunately, the actors were able to, to work through it. We, had, we managed to get five full takes of the movie. Uh, and then we had to pick the one that was going to live as the film. But most of the, I very last minute ended up becoming one of the camera operators on one of the sides. So without, I, I was the reason that two of those takes stopped because I bumped into the walls with the camera and like, or cut caught the harness that the camera was rigged to in a door frame. So all, all the, uh, all the faulty takes are on me. <laughs> and David, was there room for improv? I mean, if you felt you needed to say something or do something like that, or was this meticulously staged for the camera? You know, I mean, we were very, um, tried to be as precise as possible because there were particular blocking moments that needed to be met. But at the same time, both Sarah and I had to, who, you know, th Sarah has a background in theater um, I started my acting career uh, doing theater and uh, I've done a lot of uh, improv out here in Los Angeles. And so like, there was definitely moments where we both needed to be able and willing to be flexible or uh, if one of us went up on a line or you know, started into a different section and there were important pieces that were missing, um, you know, trusting that one of us was going to be able to sort of steer it back so that we weren't uh, losing some important information for the audience as, you know, as the film comes to its climax. Uh, you know, Sarah was always moving. Was that more of a challenge? Because Scott was pretty much stationary, but Sarah cleaned the hell out of that set or wherever you shot that movie. <laughs> she just cleaned every room, you know? So I, I just noticed she was always, was that much of a challenge versus Scott being stationary? Yeah, I that's mean, why they let us shoot there for free because she was cleaning it. Shoot, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, this movie was shot in, in my home city in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. So shout out to St. Clair College that let us use their uh, their their building there for the movie. Um, we yeah, definitely Seth Wesselestes, our our cinematographer, was the camera operator on Sarah's side of the story. He's a far more experienced camera operator than I am, so he he gets to do the heavy lifting on that. Um, and we were very reduced. There was nowhere to put, normally a camera person has their uh, camera assistant who's pulling focus, but the camera operator had to also pull their own focus. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big, big challenge. There's so much motion that at any, any one second if, if that focus goes out or whatever, we'd have to reset. So it's definitely a, a marathon, not a sprint for the camera operators. I noticed the lighting, it sets the mood, the blues and the browns. It's almost like a dreamlike setting. We I definitely, we had, you know, what was great was we could film every rehearsal and, and we did. And then we could, you know, almost, almost like the way the NFL coach or something would look at a game tape. I, I could put a rough assembly of every rehearsal together at night. And as a team, we could watch it and go, that light's too bright. What if we did this? Look at when David stands in the kitchen here. We contrast that with a, with a red color in this room. So we were able to sort of continually improve and visually. So the rehearsals for the actors were one thing. The rehearsal for the camera team was one. But then the, you know, the cinematographer and our gaffer, Doug Cunningham, could also just kind of tweak and keep perfecting their performance in terms of the visual style of the movie. And, and David, National Suicide Awareness Month, times of COVID-19. I mean, awareness is more important than ever. I feel your, your movie's just at the right time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we completely agree. You know, and the, the hope when we made this movie is that it could become somewhat of a conversation starter for people because it is, it is a narrative film. It's a story. Um, and, and we hope, and it, it seems, you know, as, as we've had festival audiences respond, that it's, that it's gripping and engaging. And so the hope was always that, you know, people could watch it and, and, you know, speak about their own experiences or that it would encourage them to reach out to someone that they may be concerned about or, um, you know, just to try to destigmatize mental health. Because I feel like um, as, as important as it is and, and as it's becoming less of a stigma, there's still that idea that it means that you're broken or that there's something wrong with you. And so, you know, that's definitely part of our, our mission, I guess, with this is to try to help people understand that it's not a taboo subject, that it's something that needs to be discussed, it needs to be referenced, uh, it needs to be understood and, and, and not, you know, demonized. 
And uh, Alamo Draft House, you guys are getting a theatrical release, which is rare in times of COVID-19. And uh, on September 18th, are you guys excited getting it out in the theaters? Definitely. There's a, there's yeah. a few platforms that people can watch it on. They can also watch it on um, Altavod and through our distributor, Mutiny, is going to have a link set up. So anybody who does want to see the film, I highly recommend just following our, our socials, like at Last Call One Take on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, or find, the, find the film page on uh, Facebook because we will share all the links of where people obviously most cinemas in, in America are closed or, or a good, a good portion it's also very hard as an independent film you know without big movie stars in it to, to go theatrical so there's like the the, dis, the disadvantage that they're closed but sometimes for a small film like us it gives us the advantage to get into the virtual cinema programs that exist through these theaters and yeah. um, and also you know gives us a bit of a leg up to experiment with new platforms and see what the, what some of the future of, of digital delivery for films will be. This is your guys' time because, you know, not being able to review any big tentpole movies from the studios, the rise of the independents and film festivals. I mean, I must have done 200 interviews in the last six months of films like yours. So... Uh, it's, it's, I wow. mean that 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 warms yeah, my that heart because it's a lot. You know, <laughs> all, all we can all we can ever ask is that people find our movie and hopefully like it. And you know, from the reviews and the we had an amazing festival run with this film and seeing audience responses during Q and As and and in the lobby afterwards. Uh, you know, I, I really, truly believe we have a movie here that people will like if, if they're willing to give it a chance. So any more people need to give indie films a chance because there's just such amazing stories being told out there outside of the mainstream. And uh, it, it breaks my heart sometimes when when very meaningful movies or, or well-crafted indie films don't don't get the spotlight they deserve. Well, last yeah, any month. independent uh, cinema owners uh, or, you know, <laughs> PVOD owners, uh, Last Call is ready for you. So uh, just... Well, I'll help get the word out. It's an amazing <laughs> film. It really is. And a comp technical accomplishment, story, message, it's, it all it fires on all thrusters, guys. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Isn't his, back, sure isn't his background really nice, David? We should probably get on that when we do these interviews. <laughs> I know. I was like, what? <laughs> with Zoom, it's real easy. I, it took me two minutes. I found your yeah. one sheet. I found a still, you know, if I can move there. And it was real easy to give you guys a junket style interview. And when you have a chance, come visit us in Las Vegas when things get better. We'd love to have you. I have, I have oh, dear friends in will. Vegas. I'd love to. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, guys. Good luck with the film. And thanks for talking to me. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.